But they say there still is a chance. Very small, virtually zero, but it's still one to the minus zero, 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 zero. So it could still happen. That's what they like to say. How do we respond to that? If we say no, it could never happen. The mathematicians say it virtually could never happen because there's so many zeros after the minus. No way. But the atheist still says it's still one to the minus zero 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 zero. So yes, it may be one in ten billionth chances or a billion 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 chances but it's still one how do you respond to that <coughs> how do you respond to that well what we say to him is listen mathematics is not true science mathematics is an approximation that we have placed on objects etc to count them and they serve a purpose to a degree but they are not absolute truth mathematics actually is a theory which applied in many circumstances works because if we take mathematics as the whole truth and nothing but the truth then there is a group of Greek philosophers who held the position that no two objects collide no two objects collide no two things can come in contact with each other so if you if there was a door here and you wanted to leave this hall according to them you could never walk out this door mathematically how is that well if the distance between here and the door is 100 feet okay for you to get through the door you have to pass through the 50 foot point right the halfway point then you have to pass through the 25 foot point right All right then you have to pass through the 12.5 foot point right and then you have to pass through half of 12.5 whatever that is huh I can't see, hear what you're saying. But anyway, you know what I'm getting at. So after you divide that, you have to pass through the halfway point after that and the halfway point after that. And if you put that into a computer, you will never reach zero. What does that mean? If you never reach zero, it means you can never reach the door. Zero is the door. Mathematically, you can never reach the door but is that real no it's not real we go through doors all the time right so we say that because they said one to the minus so and so so this is just numbers they have put these numbers it's not real what's real is that it will never happen what's real is that we go through the door but mathematically yes you can say there's a possibility you will never go through the door not only possibility according to mathematics you will never go through the door you cannot go through the door okay so we come back to reality reality is that the chances of design coming from accident systematically throughout the universe there is no way even if you said it happened once by accident everywhere everywhere no not possible absolutely impossible 
So this points us back to the designer. Now, what you find, of course, what's related to this is the argument uh, which was mentioned in, uh, I think it was last night's lecture, you know, the argument about the Big Bang, right? Which is the explanation for why we are here now. The Big Bang being an explosion, an accidental explosion. No reason for it to explode, it just exploded. And from that accident, from that accident, uh, that explosion, we have everything that is. Right? Again, we say this is nonsense, right? This is nonsense because of the fact that explosions don't produce design and order. They produce chaos, a mess. And that was explained, I think, quite graphically for you by Brother uh, Yusuf Estes. Hmm? I think we've grasped that point. So, the argument of accident and chance is a very weak argument. It is, in fact, an illogical argument. We say it's illogical. Why? Because if everything around us that has a design is produced by a designer, then does it make sense to say that the whole of this system was by accident? No. If everything in the system was chaotic, without design, and there was only a few points of design, then yes, you could conclude that the whole system was a product of accident, which accidentally produced a few designs here and there. That's logic. But what logic tells us is that there had to be a designer for there to be design everywhere. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in only a couple of verses in the Quran, tackles the argument of the atheist from the logical point of creation and created. And this is the line which Aristotle used. Right? The Quran in Surah at Tur, verses 35 and 36, says, Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqoon am khalaqu samawati wal ard bal la yuqinoon Were they created from nothing? Or did they create themselves? Or did they create the heavens and the earth? Indeed, they are uncertain. Allah gives two possibilities. The third which is the reality he doesn't mention. He leaves it for us to come to the obvious conclusion. Were they created from nothing? This is the first point to look at. To be created from nothing or by nothing. Logic tells us no way. We cannot be created from nothing. Nothing cannot produce something. Is that reasonable or not? Nothing cannot produce something. Right? Anybody have a doubt about that one? Is that too philosophical? Huh? Nothing, if you have nothing, you cannot produce something from that nothing. You must have something to produce something. Right? So, were they created from nothing? No way. Were they created by nothing? Because from nothing implies also by nothing. Can nothing create something? No. So that one is ruled out. Go to the other extreme. Did, or did they create themselves? Is it possible to create yourself? Again, logic tells us no way. Why? Because to create yourself, you first have to not exist. Isn't it? You have to not exist first. 
to create yourself. But if you didn't exist, how could you create yourself? Isn't it? Because then you're gone into the same situation of nothing producing something. Doesn't happen. Right? Is that logical? Is that clear? And these are the two options that Allah gives. Either you were created from nothing, by nothing, or you created yourself. So if you were not created by nothing, and you didn't create yourself, then what does that mean? Something created you. That's what's not mentioned in the verse. Something created you. Something created you who was himself not created. That is understood from it. Because if that something was already created, then it would be in the same category as us. Created from nothing? Created itself? No. So that third conclusion is that something uncreated created us. Something uncreated created us. This answers also the question of people who ask, okay, if God created everything, who created God? You have this question coming up, right? Kids sometimes ask it. That question is what we call a nonsensical question. To ask who created God when God is described as being uncreated is a nonsensical question. You understand that? It's nonsensical. If you say God, who is God? God is the one who is uncreated. For you to then ask, who created God? You already said he was uncreated. So how can you ask who created him? It's a nonsensical question. Is that clear? I know this gets a little philosophical here. But is that clear? Have you understood the point here? So, from that verse of the Quran, we have established here that God, who was himself uncreated, created everything. Had to be. And if a person, an atheist, might say to you, okay, God created everything, but that God was himself created, and the God who created him was also created by another God, and that God was created by another God, and so on and so on and so forth, back to, till when? Is there a point where we start where the first God started the creating of the other gods? No, no, it goes on to infinity. No beginning is the argument, okay? We say to him, okay, if the origins of this world and everything in it is in infinity, right? You can go back in a straight line, this one creator created by another creator by another creator, straight back to infinity. This means that it would take an infinite amount of time to get to this point. You understand that? If, it, if we can go back to infinity, it would mean that an infinite amount of time would have to pass before we got here. And what does that mean? It means we would never get here. That's the reality. We would never get here. The very fact that we are here now is proof that there had to be a beginning point in time for creation. Had to be. Understand? This is the argument, that issue of uh, creators back to infinity. This is how Aristotle rejected it logically. That there would be an infinite amount of time to get here, therefore we would not get here, therefore there has to be, in fact, a beginning. This is some logic, right? Anyway, the point is, the 
belief in God, as we said, is logical and reasonable. The atheist, after being confronted with this logic and reason, then turns to other arguments. What does he say? He says, well, as Brother Yusuf Estes mentioned yesterday, but he didn't give you the answer for it. If your God is so good, you got a good God, right? Your God is good. And he's all powerful. Then where did evil come from? Where did evil come from? Did the God create evil? Huh? Did God create evil? Huh? Did God create evil? No. Then who created evil? You see, if you say God didn't create evil, then you're saying there's some other creator besides God. Poof, that's serious. Huh? God created what? God's creation became evil. God's creation became evil. Did he allow his creation to become evil? Huh? Did he allow it? But he's a good God. You still got the problem. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. Did God create evil? Huh? Disobedience created evil? Did Allah allow that disobedience? It's a free will. Huh? Free will. Free will. But does free will act without Allah's permission? It's not created evil. It's not created evil. Hmm? God created evil as a test. Pardon? God did create evil, but for a test. We're not talking about why. We're talking about did he? Yes. 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 God created evil. He created everything. However, what you find in the Quran is that when Allah talks about evil, and also in the Sunnah, Prophet ﷺ talks about evil relative to Allah. He doesn't attribute it directly to Allah. He says, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn. Ming sharri ma khalaq. Allah says, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn. Ming sharri ma khalaq. From the evil of what he created. He doesn't say, Min sharri khalaq. From the evil he created. But from the evil of what he created. He created this thing and evil came from it. But it is his creation. You see? But he does not attribute it directly to himself. And this is a part of etiquette in how we deal with Allah. But we're looking here now, practically speaking. Yes, evil is a part of Allah's creation. However, how to understand evil? What we explain is that Allah has not created anything which is purely evil. Nothing which is purely evil. Everything will have an element of good to it. Everything will have an element of good to it. And it is for that element of good that Allah created it. You understand? For that element of good, Allah created that thing. So even Satan, so I say, what about Satan? Well, Satan, before he disbelieved in Allah, was he evil? No. No. Before he disobeyed Allah and disbelieved in him, he was good. Furthermore, consider Allah knew before he created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden and forbade them from one tree he knew that 
Satan was going to come and trick him and Adam would eat and Eve would eat from the tree. So, why did Allah create Satan? If Satan hadn't come in the picture, Adam and Eve would have remained in paradise. We all would be in paradise. Finish. No problem. Right? So the question is, why did Allah then create Satan knowing what he was going to do? See, actually for some people, they have a problem with this. I know I spoke with the Jehovah's Witnesses and they claim that Allah didn't know what Satan was going to do. And you have actually some Muslim thinkers like uh, Allama Muhammad Iqbal in his book, The Reconstruction of Islamic Thought, written in English. He states in there that Allah does not know the details of the future. He doesn't know the details of the future. He knows the future in general, but the details, he doesn't know it until it occurs. That's serious. It's serious. The point is, what we say is that when Adam tricked, or oh, sorry, when Satan tricked Adam and Adam ate from the tree, what happened adam here fell into sin remember adam was a prophet of god here he fell into sin so when we talk about prophets being infallible it's not infallible in all aspects infallible relative to revelation not that they were incapable of error because that was a big error right there wasn't it was it or not when he ate from the tree was that a sin it was a sin now when satan disobeyed god refused to bow to adam did he commit a sin yes he committed a sin why is satan considered to be a disbeliever why does Allah call him a disbeliever huh because because of his arrogance okay his arrogance feeling that he was superior to adam if you feel arrogant right feeling you're superior to somebody else does that make you a disbeliever hmm? okay no, we deal with one point at a time because okay. first we said it's because of his arrogance feeling he was superior to adam okay we can say that's error that's a mistake that is not kufr this is not disbelief So how did he fall into disbelief? Huh? He didn't repent. So if you commit a sin and don't repent, does that make you a disbeliever? From the women. Huh? Pride? Better take the microphone. I can't hear you, please. He refused to acknowledge his sin. He didn't acknowledge his sin. That's what we said already. He didn't acknowledge his sin. He, took, he disobeyed Allah's command. Okay, that's what we're saying here. He disobeyed Allah's command. Adam disobeyed Allah's command. So, Adam is not considered the disbeliever. Is, this is the point of, of, of Aqidah. Does disobedience make a person a disbeliever? If that is the case, we're all disbelievers in this room. Have none of us dis disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He challenged Allah. He challenged Allah. Pride, he challenged Allah. Pride. Stop. Pride is... Stop and think here, please. 
think this is an important point of aqidah we want to need to grasp this carefully don't rush and say this and say that stop and think sins don't make a person a disbeliever even if you don't repent from the sin it doesn't make you a disbeliever hmm? this is the belief of the main body of muslims you had a group you know in the time of ali radiallahu anhu the khawarij they took the position that if you commit a major sin you become a disbeliever that was their belief this is not the belief of ahl sunnah wal jama'ah the belief of ahl sunnah wal jama'ah is that sins do not make a person a disbeliever in and of themselves so adam committed a sin satan iblis committed a sin we can say okay satan did not repent adam repented but when we say that sins don't make you a disbeliever it means that if you don't repent from that sin that is not enough to make you a disbeliever adam accepted it as a sin whereas satan didn't accept it as a sin no again your your explanation is that adam accepted his sin whereas satan didn't accept his sin that if you commit a sin and don't accept that it is a sin does that mean you're going to hell forever as a disbeliever no go ahead sister he said that he rejected what allah said he said he claimed that he knew better by saying that he was better than adam he, he knew better than, than allah okay this is the point of disbelief when he said i am better than him right that's his pride that's one issue but when he said i'm better than him and the law instructed him to bow he refuses to bow saying i am better than adam right what is he saying here you made a mistake he challenged allah yeah no the challenge is after that's another issue this is the point here he is attributing to allah a mistake that you shouldn't have asked me to bow to adam because i'm better than him this is where the disbelief comes because can we attribute mistakes to allah no no this is where the disbelief comes he attributes to allah error in his judgment and now we say he didn't repent from it that in and of itself was a statement of kufr but if he repented from it it could have removed it from him because repentance purifies us from sin but here is now when the lack of repentance now comes into play so here's where his disbelief now is affirmed and he goes on into more arrogance you know that if you let me until the last day i will misguide everybody and he just went on with arrogance from one step to another but his disbelief lay in attributing to allah error and refusing to repent from it this is where the disbelief that's important because we don't want to understand that he became a disbeliever because he disobeyed allah because we all disobey allah and it would mean we're all disbelievers okay so come back to our point the point is that when iblis tricked adam adam committed the sin ate from the tree he then turned back to allah in repentance right he turned back to allah in repentance now the act of repentance is that a great act of worship or not yes. it is among the greatest acts of worship prophet ﷺ said the one who repents from sin is like one without sin so that is a great act of worship of ibadah so satan's tricking adam caused adam to disobey turn back in repentance 
and came back with this great act of Ibadah, the repentance. So his purpose, Satan, was to have Adam repent. Repentance was a great good produced by evil. The evil of Iblis and Adam's sin. Follow that? Not only that, when he, when Adam and Eve repented to Allah, Allah forgave them. If Allah forgave them, isn't it? And Allah's forgiving is the manifestation of his attributes of being the forgiver, the oft forgiver. And that is a great, you know, enormous act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So great, the Prophet sallam said, if you didn't commit sins and turn back to Allah in repentance, Allah would have erased you from the earth and produced another set of people who would commit sins, turn back in repentance to Allah, and Allah would forgive them. That's in Sahih Muslim. So Allah's act of repentance, uh, sorry, of forgiveness for uh, Adam and Eve's repentance is a great good. And Adam and Eve's turning to Allah in repentance is a great good. And what was it produced by? Evil of Satan. Can we understand that? Huh? Can we understand the principle here? So, for us, when, we, when the person asks, well, evil, where did it come from? Yes, Allah. It is a part of what Allah has permitted in this world. He's created. It's part of his creation. But, he did not create that evil for what appears to you as evil, but for a good purpose which you can't see. For a good purpose which you can't see. And I gave the example before about good which comes from evil which we can see. It can happen. We can see it. And sometimes you can't see it. And that's life. Isn't it? Somebody comes up to you and says, I have this needle. I would like to stick it in your arm. Can I get your arm here, please, and stab this needle in your, your arm? What are you going to say? Of course not. Why? <laughs> I'm not a masochist. You know, a masochist is one person who likes pain, likes people inflicting pain on them, right? Sick. I know. I'm not a masochist. I don't want that pain. But if typhoid comes here, you run to the doctor. Doctor, please stick that needle in my arm. Now, the sticking of the needle in your arm, in and of itself, is an evil. Isn't it? When the poor one asked if I can stab the needle in your arm, it was the same evil. Stabbing the needle here, the doctor stabbing the needle, it's evil. But, in the second case, you are accepting that harm, not because you like the feel of a needle sticking into your skin, but because you believe there is a great good which will come from it. You follow that? So you accept evil for a greater good. We do that all the time in our lives. We're functioning like that all the time. Isn't it? Okay? So we say in the same way, you can recognize that. It happens in everybody's life. We're all doing it. In the same way, in Allah's creation, what you perceive as evil is in fact for a greater good. Now, the person may ask, well, okay, I can understand in the case of the needle, that's where you can see the good. But what about these other cases? The tsunami. Where is the good in that? How many hundreds of thousand people lost their lives? Where is the good? How do you answer that? Where is the good? Well, the point is, the fact that you can't see the good, does that mean there's no good? This is the point. Huh? As they say in, in, in Islamic uh, thought, 
The lack of knowledge of a thing is not knowledge. Right? The fact that you have no knowledge about something is not knowledge about that thing. That's just a lack of knowledge. That's all it is. A lack of knowledge. So the fact that you don't know the good which came from the tsunami doesn't mean there isn't good. It just means you don't know. That's all. All you can say is, I don't know the good. But the fact that you don't know it doesn't mean that it isn't there. Maybe you'll see it after 10 years. Maybe 100 years from now, we'll see it. That the shifting of the plate there, had it shifted somewhere else, a million people would have lost their lives. So it shifted in a place where only 100,000 lost their lives instead of a million. It was better to shift there than the other place. I'm just positing. You could, if you want to sit down and figure out scenarios, you know, where it really was for the good, you can't imagine them. You can. Yeah. So, this is our response to their argument that simply because we can't see the good that is behind something, it doesn't mean that there is no good. Now, in dealing with the atheist, it is also good to point out to him or her that although they like to claim that they don't believe in God in fact they do in fact they actually do believe in God because you sit that atheist down and you ask him or her you in your life you know you are successful you're a successful businessman or businesswoman, whatever. You had a classmate who did the same thing as you, graduated the same time as you, maybe even got better marks than you. But that classmate of yours is now a beggar, walking in the streets, begging people. But you are successful. Why are you successful and he or she is a failure? What is your answer? Huh? Luck. That's the answer. My good luck. Her bad luck. <laughs> this is what they say. My good luck, her bad luck. Well, guess what? If we go from the beginning of that person's day, when they get up in the morning, till the time they go to sleep at night, and you keep asking them, why this? Why not that? Why this? Why not that? You find that throughout their day, they're just saying good luck, bad luck, good luck, bad luck, good luck, bad luck. So what? You mean your whole day is covered? Your week, your month, your year, your whole life is governed by good luck and bad luck. Well, in English, we have another word for luck. It is fortune. They say good fortune and bad fortune. Now, the term fortune comes from a Greek Roman uh, word Fortuna which is the name of the goddess of good luck and bad luck so here is your God it's just you're not you know recognizing it and and uh, uh, putting a statue and actually going through the motions but you have your God you have the goddess of good luck and bad luck, Fortuna. There's your God. And how do you worship that God? Besides believing in the God, you have your rituals. There are different rituals that they have for good luck and bad luck, right? The rituals are the charms that you wear on your bracelets, you know, different things that you do. Some people feel, for example, if you've just graduated from school, from uh, college or whatever you go out for a job you go one month two months you don't find a job then eventually you find a job right what do you do when you get home the suit that you wore you put in a special place your tie you put in a special place your shoes everything and this becomes your good luck suit so whenever you have to go out and you need some good luck you make sure you put on that suit or that belt or those shoes or whatever these are your rituals these are your rites of worship okay and everybody has them people who deny god they are involved you'll see them involved in so much whether it is this wastu 
you know you have this wasto business right you know and the chinese call it feng shui you know shift around things in your house and open windows and this is going to bring good luck for you this is all these are rites of worship these are rites of worship you know so even the person who claims he doesn't believe in god they have a god and they worship that god now if we leave the atheist and we go over to the deist the deist as we said was one who believes god created the world and left it to run on its own and this is quite common among many people who follow religion today many christians number of hindus you'll find that they're deists if you ask what's your religion they say hinduism it's christianity but when you actually sit and talk to them they really don't believe god yes there is a god but all these religions really are man-made there's another way some people say i don't like i believe in god but i don't like or i don't believe in organized religion i'm sure you've heard that one right so we say to them you prefer a disorganized religion do you because huh? huh? if you don't like an organized religion then you must be for a disorganized religion what a chaotic religion that you made up from bits and pieces here there and everywhere so the point is for the deist he or she believes basically that Allah God did not communicate his will to humankind that's the bottom line God created us, left us on our own. We find our own purposes, etc., etc. But we say to them, what you are doing when you say this is to attribute to God the worst of characteristics. You are attributing to God the worst of characteristics. Why? Because if somebody factory owner he builds this wonderful factory he puts an ad for factory workers hires the people tells them where the factory is but doesn't tell them what to do in the factory what's gonna happen they're gonna march into the factory and everybody just go sitting in his position and start doing what he's supposed to do no they will go to the canteen the cafeteria the restaurant drink tea you know coffee chat and until somebody comes and tell them hey you know you've got a job to do here this is your job and so on so on. so the idea some you know an industrialist who did that what would you think of that industrialist he's a fool he's an idiot you're gonna hire people you don't tell them what they need to do children at school if you send children to school you don't tell them what they're supposed to do you think they're just gonna march into school march into their classroom sit down and wait for the teacher to teach them no as soon as they hit the doors of the school they're going straight to the playground swinging on the swing sliding on the slides you know they'll do that until somebody says come get in the class again a school which doesn't inform the students what to do is foolish idiotic so now when you say Allah created this world and didn't tell us what to do in this world what is that saying what is that saying we don't know what the purpose is god just created us no purpose identified somebody comes knocking on your door you open the door you say who do you want he says i don't know uh why are you standing here knocking on my door i don't know What are you going to do with that person? You run back, get your telephone, call the insane asylum, tell them, listen, I have a case here on my door. Come get him, please. Okay. Somebody who does things without reason, this is somebody who has lost his mind. Right? So when we attribute God to creating us without reason, that's what we're doing. This is a, this is a very evil thing to say. So we say no logic and reason common sense tells us 
that God conveyed his will to human beings. He told them what to do. He provided them with the manual. You make a machine, you give it to somebody without any manual. What do you think they're going to do with that machine? Break it up. Isn't it? They're going to smash it up. They're going to misuse it. Of course, Allah gave the manual. He conveyed the message. So the arguments of the deist is a weak argument. In the case of the uh, agnostic, in the case of the agnostic, we can really just say this person is a lazy disbeliever. He's just a lazy atheist. He's not committing fully. He says, I, I don't know that there is a God, but I don't know that there is not a God. <laughs> what is this? Hey, hey, you're a disbeliever. Really? You're just, you don't believe there's a God. Because you cannot not be sure. You know, and unfortunately, we have a lot of Muslims today who worship Allah in this way. They worship Allah not being certain that Allah exists. They don't pray all year, but when Ramadan comes, you see them praying. Fasting and praying. And you ask them why. They'll tell you, if they're honest, just in case. What do you mean just in case? Just in case, if I have to come before Allah, I can say, well, you know, I was doing some fasting, I did some prayers, etc., etc. Just in case. That is not acceptable belief. The only acceptable belief is belief with certainty. Some atheists or deists will say, Islam, if it's good for you, it's fine. No problem. But the most important thing is just to be good. Right? If it's good for you, no problem. It's great. But what's most important is just being good. How do we respond to this kind of statement? It's most important just to be good. We say to them, how do you define good? What may be good for you may not be good for me. Right? What may be good for me may not be good for you. So how do we find good? It's not enough just to be good. We need to know what is really good. What is ultimately good. And you and I, if it's just up to us, we will always define good as what is good for us. So that is not a criterion. It's not enough to say as long as you do good. And that's why we have the issue of Mother Teresa or Gandhi or these other issues that came up before. You know, they did good, so why this should this happen to them since they were so good? No, because what has happened in their case, people have considered the evil of not believing in God. People have considered the evil of not believing in God as he's supposed to be believed in and worshipping him as being something very small. It's just a small bad. Huh? In comparison to the great good that people may do in terms of serving, helping, and all this kind of thing, isn't it? That's what they've done. They've tried to weigh things. Now this small act of disbelief in your view cannot surely outweigh all of the good that the person has done in their life. But the bottom line is what? Do we know what their intention was behind the good they did? Do we know what their intention was? Because if I do good for you because I want something from you, or I do it because I want to make a show to become famous, etc. Is that real good? You may not know that. All you can see is the good act. But the intention behind that act can change the quality of the act altogether. And turn it from a good into an evil. People may use what appears to be good to, to exploit others. There is a book which is currently on the um, bestsellers list in the US. 
available on Amazon.com. It's called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. You know what a hitman is? A man who's given the job of taking out other people, killing them, whatever, right? But he calls himself an economic hitman. Basically, what he explains is that he, for the last 30 odd years, worked for the US government as an economic hitman. What he, was, what, what he used to do was he was sent into countries, third world countries. He would offer them huge loans, good money, lots of money, taken from the World Bank as a loan to them, which is so great that it is impossible for the country to pay off the loan. When they can't pay off the loan, right, they have a debt, then they have interest on the debt, they spend their time just trying to pay off the interest and they're struggling just with the interest which is increasing and increasing and increasing so they have been caught their economies have been subverted so when the world bank tells them do this they do it tell them do that they do it and it is at the command of the u.s as he explains the american empire an economic empire Right. So that great good of the loan, normally a loan, if somebody says, I need some money, you know, I need some help, I provide you with a loan, that's a good thing. It's a nice thing. But they are using the loan to entrap people and to turn them into slaves. Their society now is enslaved to the American economy. This is just an example. You know, it can come in many other ways. That good is relative depending on the intention behind it uh, it appears that um, inshallah we'll not have much more time um, please tomorrow we will have a practical on da'wah to atheists then we'll go on to uh, da'wah to christians and uh, have a practical for that too and eventually to hindus and we have also difficult questions to look at in da'wah uh, for now, just try to go over your notes and information that you have uh, tomorrow for the practical. We'll do the same thing that we did today. And we pray on hope that by tomorrow the notes will be in your hands. You know, what can I say? You know, I, as I said, I gave them the information. They're still sorting out the papers and printing and all these kind of things. Inshallah, hopefully it will be in your hands tomorrow. And um, uh, they will... Uh, give you an exam for it the following day tomorrow is the last day of the program and then the following day there will be an examination uh, multiple choice and um, those of you that pass it will be given certificates of having passed this uh, done the course requirements those of you that fail it or didn't do it you can still receive a certificate of attendance. Okay? So, inshallah, we'll close now for preparing for Salatul Maghrib. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha ilaha ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu